Okay, so let's go back um, to verse 35, just in a momentary review. Talking about the resurrection, there are people in Corinth that have been discouraged uh, against their faith in the resurrection. Some people say there is no resurrection from the dead. How many of you can remember to, and repeat back to me that uh, little uh, kind of quote that goes floating around churches about the Sadducees and the Pharisees? Anybody remember that? The, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. Uh, and it, you know what? We believe in the resurrection, you know? And um, it, we're talking now about the body. What is this going to be like? What is the resurrected body? How are we going to function? What body are we going to be raised with? And that's where Paul has left off, in our, at least in our study at this point. So someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? And then he addresses them in what in English would seem to be a very abrupt, foolish one. What you sow is not made alive unless it dies. Uh, what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain. He's illustrating perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. And you can see the illustrative factor there that he's using with natural grain like wheat or barley or corn or something. So then he goes into the idea of the flesh. And um, this is some biology and some DNA study that uh, is really wonderful science creation science that um, when Paul wrote this scientists didn't know this and we do know uh, that God knew it and therefore inspired Paul to know it and therefore to communicate it to us not all flesh is the same he says all flesh is not the same flesh but there is one kind of flesh of men another flesh of animals another of fish and another of birds and so that is actually true uh, in, in biology, we know this, and uh, DNA study. Uh, also, the, we, I think we talked a little bit about this last week. Uh, we talked about the idea of uh, replication and things only re uh, replicating uh, after their own kind. You know, you can't have a dog and a bird uh, uh, bring forth an offspring. Uh, different kinds of cats, different kinds of dogs. Within a species, you know, you can work... Uh, in this way, but you, you, things rip, uh, re reproduce in their own kind. That's the, using the phraseology of Genesis uh, 1 and um, God's work with the, in creation and, and uh, chapter 2, 3. I think it's chapter 3 that might reference that most uh, directly. So there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. Uh, heavenly and earthly, and the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So the heavenly and the earthly. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. And of course, communicating to us in the, the language of the Bible, and uh, scientists today, some scientists will tell you that our, star, our sun is a star, and it's the smallest star in a galaxy or something. I don't know about astronomy, but uh, the Bible calls the sun uh, the sun, not a star, and makes a distinction between the sun and the, and the stars. So I'll leave that to the, the creation scientists and the, the, the astronomers and uh, others to argue about. Um, I'm going to just go with the Bible. I kind of like it. Um, there's also the resurrection of the dead. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. D don't you like this list? Uh, you know, I do anyway. Uh, it's raised in, or sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. The, our bodies are corruptible. They're they're decaying. You know they get gallbladder problems and stuff. Um, but they will be raised in incorruption. There's no corruptibility to it. It's 
It's going to last forever. It's not going to get sick. Uh, I love that. It's sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Uh, and we know that. Uh, you know, oftentimes, I mean, obviously this is a generalization, but when a person gets older or they're very sick, the body decays, there's problems. Um, my Aunt Harriet, uh, for example, just side note story. Um, sorry I, to kind of make this a little bit graphic, but uh, she had t terrible cancer. They'd taken over her entire body. She weighed about 70-some pounds right before she passed away, and her body was very discolored. And uh, she was extremely weak and unable, unable to uh, communicate. And uh, right before she passed away, uh, all the color rushed into her body. She sat up in bed, and she started talking. And you're thinking, now, wait a minute. Th this, you read about this stuff in you know, books, sometimes that you have to discredit. Other times you go, wow, this is amazing. And uh, she sat up in the bed, and uh, she started talking. And she says, oh, Walter, her husband, who was right there in the room, uh, you're going to love it here. Uh, the fishing looks incredible. And, and, and <laughs> what? You know, what are you talking about, right? Well, she hated water. And she's referring to the water. And she's talking about how glorious the water is. And uh, the fishing. And then she starts naming off people that she's seeing. And all these people had passed away. And so she says, oh, look, there's... And she's calling off names and stuff. This was my own aunt. Uh, what an amazing thing. You know, glorious. And then she laid down in the bed and that was it. She, she uh, passed away. And so, wow, what a neat thing God did. But, you know, the body was sown in dishonor. It was, it was you know, diseased and it was small and it was uh, weak and yet glorious things ahead. Did I mention to you guys about the guy, uh, Ron Madsen, that had the dream about Chuck Missler before he passed away? Did I mention that last week? I did, so good. Uh, you, you didn't hear it? Okay, well, those of you that heard it already, put your hands like this and go, uh. Um, but, uh, yeah, Ron Madsen was sharing at the memorial service for Chuck here uh, last week ago Saturday um, that he had a dream. that He had been up with Chuck really late into the night. Chuck was super weak. He was in hospice care. And he decided, I got to get some sleep. So he went to his room to get some sleep. And uh, during his sleep, he had a dream that Chuck was like 40-year-old guy, and he's wearing Bermuda shorts and a pink shirt. Now, why? I don't know what the... Uh, but that he was, you know, standing out in a beautiful pasture, and he was excited. I can't remember all the details. And um, then they, uh, he was dreaming, and he, he was in bed, and the guy runs into the room and wakes him up and says, Ron, uh, Chuck just passed away. And you go, wow. You know, uh, and he, had just, he was having that dream. Right then, is that another one of those little glimpses? God pulls back the veil, gives people hope. I love it. I love it. You know, uh, glorious things. Oh, how many of our relatives, friends, family have already gone on ahead of us? And you know what? They're not suffering. Their body's sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. This is exciting. The hope of the believer. You know, it's, it's not over. We're not sad, you see, because we believe in the resurrection. Amen. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Now, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Now, that is really interesting. God has, and, and you, you, you know, you turn back the pages a bit and you might go into Genesis and you think about how God created man, a natural body. But remember that even that natural physical body was, before the fall, incapable of death. And uh, uh, wouldn't have suffered any disease. There was no curse, etc. And so uh, God has made the body in a, in a way that he is going to restore that. Uh, all that the, the cross did, all that Jesus did, is to bring back and restore everything that man forfeited, lost, and suffered as a result of sin. Jesus became our answer to sin. The problem of sin is remedied in Christ. And so we're going to live forever. We're going to have a glorious future body. And God has prepared an eternal body for us. Interestingly enough, and sadly, uh, from the perspective of the human uh, uh, viewpoint, uh, is that there is also a spiritual body that the damned will be equipped with. 
uh, because the damned will suffer forever in, in an eternal hell. And uh, boy, we just don't like talking about that. Uh, we don't want anyone to go there. Uh, it is not uh, in God's wishes, if you will, that men uh, end up in hell. But God has allowed for man to, to, to act out in rebellion and or reject the free offer of salvation. Uh, he desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. First uh, Peter, I think it's chapter 2. He desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But not all men do. And so there's going to be those that have rejected the gospel and those that will end up in an endless eternity. And God has prepared a body for them that where the worm dieth not. You know, where the fl smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. Uh, wow, tragic, uh, but a reality, a spiritual body, both for those that are going to live on eternally with Christ uh, in the glory of his millennial kingdom and beyond in the new heaven and new earth, and then the unfortunate side of uh, uh, the, the eternal destiny of the lake of fire. Ultimately, will hell, hell and death will be cast into the lake of fire uh, and um, uh, then, of course, that is the continuing uh, suffering of the individuals that end up in hell. Somebody asked me one day, um, you know, why does hell have to be forever? You know, you, you go, man, let's just use Methuselah, for example, the oldest man that ever lived, 969 years old. You, you would think, okay, out of equity, justice, righteousness, fairness, whatever, uh, you, you would say, well, look, if a, even, even if a guy was like as old as Methuselah or older, let's say he was a thousand years old and he rebelled against the Lord for a thousand years, refused to be saved, um, and uh, he ends up in hell, why not equate his punishment equal to his crime in the, in the sense that he was alive for a thousand years and rejected the Lord and then ended up uh, in hell and he should be in hell for a thousand years and then he, his life is over. Well, the problem is we, see, we're thinking like humans because we think that when we die, we cease. And so what we don't recognize then is that we don't cease. In fact, when you die, you don't even lose consciousness. Your body does, Right? And so you go from this life into the next life in literally an unknown uh, process of time. It's instant. And so the person that is unsaved and they end up in hell, that person is still conscious. They're aware. They know who they are. They know their history. We know this from the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember my brothers, go tell them, warn them of this place, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you're very conscious, you're very aware. And um, the, the problem is that the Bible tells us that the people that are under that judgment don't repent. And so how could you end their punishment? Because the, their, their rebellion continues. The Bible says that they gnaw their tongues for pain and curse the God who made them. And so you would think, well, man, enough time in hell, anybody would repent, but it's not the case. And so hell is endless because the, the, the rebellion is endless. Uh, tragic to think about. And in the same way, though, the glorious side for you and me, uh, our desire to love God, to serve God, to worship God, uh, to be active in our personal relationship with God is also endless. And so we enjoy that long, uh, what, what does long mean when we're talking about no end life in God? I'm so glad. A lot of times people ask the question, well, is there any chance that after we die we're going to rebel? No, no chance. Uh, no record of that in the Bible, no indication of it whatsoever. In fact, always to the contrary. Um, I'm going to tell you a verse, one verse that should solidly answer in the end of the argument for the, the security of the believer, uh, Jesus speaking, I will give them eternal life and they will never perish. I will give them eternal life. The Lord gives eternal life and when he gives that eternal life, that person will never perish. End of subject for the eternal security uh, arguments. Amen?
John 10, verse 28. Since we're doing that, should we just add to it? Uh, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. So if the gift, I will give him eternal life. And uh, how about uh, Ephesians? Uh, this one, at least I can reference, 2, 8, and 9. Chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Uh, gifts and callings are without repentance. God gives you the gift of eternal life, not of works, lest any man should boast. I will give them eternal life. They shall never perish. I think we're secure. Amen? Love it. Uh, by the way, let's talk, if we get time and we get through this, about the eternal insecurity of the believer, uh, if there was ever such a thing. But a bad doctrine will create that, and uh, we don't have that here. We have the eternal security of the believer, but there is a bad doctrine out there that is the eternal insecurity of the believer. And we, if we have time, we can kind of walk you through the steps that get to that uh, conclusion. So it is also written the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And of course, the first Adam referenced here uh, is Adam, as we know him, man. His, the Adam means man. Uh, and uh, the first man ever created, uh, Adam. And uh, the second Adam, meaning man, the, the real man, the life-giving man, is Jesus. Uh, we see this earlier in this book, 1 Corinthians. We see it in Romans. Uh, and so uh, the man, man suffered death because of sin. Jesus came and remedied the problem of sin and gave life everlasting. However, verse 46, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual, in comparison to the dishonor and honor, the inglorious and the glorious, etc. And so the, the natural man, we're, we are natural people, and when we die as believers, we will be spiritual people with a body formed by God that is designed to last for eternity. Uh, and I might mention a physical body. It is a physical body unlike what we know. Uh, he is here building a case for the spiritual body, but there is a, a, a spiritual natural body, in other words, physical body. Uh, remember, Jesus said, touch my hands, uh, touch my side. Do you have any f lunch, any food? Uh, let's have a piece of fish and some bread on the side of the Galilee. Peter, do you love me? You remember all that? Uh, and um, uh, so Jesus walked through walls in a physical body. What? How does all that happen? You know. Well, we don't understand all the dynamics of that spiritual, physical body. Uh, but the, Paul is building a case for that. The first man was of the earth made out of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the, the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, the first Adam, uh, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, Christ, the life-giving spirit. And so we will are given a promise. It's not a matter of maybe. It is a we will. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Again, its focus is on the eternal and the new heaven, the new earth. Uh, the, the language here that would be important, and I could probably do some uh, additional dissecting on, is the, the words kingdom of God, uh, because we are talking about the eternal kingdom in this particular context. But if we're talking about the natural kingdom of God, which is Jesus' physical reign on the earth, he is going to return to the earth physically. He is going to establish his earthly kingdom. His throne will be in Jerusalem. He will reign in the temple on the throne of David, and he will reign for a thousand years. You and I, by that time, will have been raptured. We will have been in heaven. We will return with the Lord after the wedding to enjoy the wedding feast on the earth. If I go too fast, stop me. Uh, the, the wedding feast is not in heaven, it's on the earth. The wedding is in heaven. So there will be guests that will be invited to the wedding during the millennial kingdom, but we will be there in spiritual bodies, a physical body, but spiritual. The kind of body Jesus had post-resurrection, where he could eat the fish and walk through a wall. And that will be our, uh, our state. 
in those days. And so even in that context, we believers are those who inherit the kingdom that is prepared from before the foundations of the world. Uh, and, and this is the word that is given when we hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Inherit the kingdom. And so we're excited to know that we're going to inherit the kingdom of God. But then he goes on to talk about this as a mystery. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In this context, sleep means be dead temporarily in the grave, in the ground. Uh, and so I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorrupt corruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And then let's go back over those verses and, and move forward from there. So he's talking about the, the inglorious body and the glorious body. The, the, sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. I tell you a, a mystery. We're not going to all be in that state forever. Uh, we are going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet. Hmm. The last trumpet, huh? Now, eschatology students are going to get excited because um, you have a lot of trumpets in the Bible and you have a lot of last trumpets in the Bible and now you're having to ask which one. Um, the dispensation that we're in right now is the church age. And the church age is going to climax with the last trumpet, an announcement. If you go back into Exodus and look at the law, you're going to see that there was an announcement made when God was present or announcement made when the, the king or priest needed to make a, a statement. Uh, and so it was a, an all attention. Everybody's at attention. And so at the end of the church age, the rapture of the church is going to take place at a time when we will, as a ch church age Christian, hear the last trumpet of the church age. There is the last trumpet of the tribulation if you're going to count trumpets and a lot of people that get really into this uh, timeline eschatology and don't understand good solid dis uh, dispensationalism they will say well the last trump is the trumpet in um, the book of the revelation because there are seven trumpet blasts remember in each one are, are judgments the seventh uh, opens up the seven bowls of wrath and so somebody will say, well, that means that we're going to be raptured mid-trib because the seventh trumpet during the tribulation is the mid-trib. No, there's a lot of other arguments for, for why that would not be the case. We don't have time for them tonight. Uh, but the, one of the things that they miss is the trumpets that will be blown during the millennium. And so then you've got a problem if you say, well, the last trump then has to be in the millennium. Well, that means that we're not going to get raptured until the millennium. And that's going to be contradictory to other raptures and resurrections that take place even at the time of the second coming of Christ. All the Jews that were by faith looking forward to the promises of God that, di that died before the church age began get resurrected at the end of the tribulation, uh, before the purple half circle, at the end of the, of the red half circle. Uh, and that is the, the saints that are raised up. Uh, again, we could get into the five different phases of the resurrection. We didn't have time tonight. We've done it before. Uh, you won't remember them all uh, right out of the top of your head, but we could talk about it another time. Again, just so I can at least finish the chapter and then talk about the eternal insecurity of the believer. So, um, <clears throat> just for fun, you know. Um, so what about all the trumpets in the millennium? There's going to be trumpets. There's going to be a priesthood. There's going to be a, a temple during the millennium. Now, there is no temple in the new heaven and the new earth. But in the millennium, there is a temple. And there is a priesthood. And there is offerings. And there is worship. And there are trumpets. We know that. And the trumpets will be blown. And announcements will be made. So you can't put the last trumpet in the tribulation. And you can't put the last trumpet in the millennial kingdom. It has to be the last trumpet of the church age. 
That makes sense? All right. <coughs> o death, where is your sting? O Hades, O hell, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Now, was it last Wednesday night that I talked to you about antinomianism? Was it? Was it two weeks ago? Was I here last Wednesday? Where was I last Wednesday? Was I here? I thought I was here. I was here? Yeah, okay. I never know where I am anymore. Am I in Colorado? Am I in Israel? Where am I? I'm not in Hawaii, I can tell you that. <laughs> I got to wait all the way to January, eh? Uh, yeah, Gil's on his way to Gil. Yeah, if it's still there, is right. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it will be. It might just be bigger, you know. I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> I don't go to Kona anyway. I go to Maui, and there's no earthquakes happening there right now, at least. Thank God. Only uh, only text to your phone that said this is a missile incoming. It's not a drill. You guys, you, do you remember that? Well, I was there when I got that text. Man, I kept that. I, I took a. You know, you can take your phone and you can. Take a picture of your screen. I kept that because I looked at that thing once in a while. I go, man, what a deal. That was something else. So the sting of death is sin. Sin caused the death. It made uh, death effective because of the sin and, and what occurred because of sin. But the strength of sin is the law. Antinomianism, we talked about. I'm not going to go there again. I did actually do a PowerPoint version of what I kind of ran through with you guys, whatever, whenever it was, for Longmont. Uh, and so I have the PowerPoint, the slides, and all the notes. If you want that, you can email and we can send that to you. Because uh, it just kind of more organized the talk I gave you guys off the cuff uh, last time. And so um, we're not lawless. We're not licentious. Uh, but the Old Covenant law that brought death, the ministry of death, that is what the Old Covenant law was called, the ministry of death, has uh, been annulled. It is obsolete. And now we live in the law of the spirit of liberty in Christ Jesus our Lord, the law of love. And uh, so moral laws are valuable to us because love emphasizes moral laws, not because we go back and revisit the Old Covenant law, but remember the illustration of the Windows, Windows 95, Windows 10, right? And Windows 95 is obsolete. Windows 10 is the current version of Windows. And there are, might be some similarities, but look, it's, it's not the same. Windows 95 is not Windows 10. And we, we understand all that stuff. And so the strength of sin is the law. And the law has been dealt with in Christ. Therefore, sin has lost its sting. It doesn't have, it's not your ruler anymore. It's not your taskmaster anymore. Uh, you know, the law was a tutor to bring you to Christ. But after you have come to Christ, you are no longer under a tutor. That's his Galatians and Paul's uh, argument with them. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the strength of sin and death has been conquered in the resurrected Christ who conquered sin and death and the law that condemned. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I'd like to spend a whole night on just that verse. Therefore, my beloved, you that are loved, brethren, you're part of the family, be steadfast, keep your focus, immovable, don't be swayed, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And, and I just, lately this has been on my mind so much. I, I don't know, you know how we go through seasons uh, in our life? Uh, and in our, in, even in ministry, you go through seasons where God is just putting something on you for a while. One of the things that's just been so present for me of, of the recent weeks, months, and I think it started with that five-year-old little girl at the school uh, when, when I was ministering to her about heaven um, against my wishes, remember? Um, and making me realize how many people out there really don't know the gospel. 
See, what are we talking about when we talk about the gospel? Being set free from the power of, the, of sin? Being set free from the power of the law that condemns? Being set free from the bondages of death? Uh, that there is a hope after this death? That we're not going to uh, sleep? We're going to be changed. It's a mystery hidden in the Old Testament, now revealed in the New, that you're going to be resurrected to life. Oh, what would Solomon have thought if he had understood this mystery when he was writing the Ecclesiastes? And he says, uh, eat, drink, for tomorrow you die. That is all there is. When man is done, there is no remembrance of him in the grave. Is that true? It's, it says that in the Bible. Well, it's because that was Solomon's musings. He didn't know what we know today. And here he is now, Paul, by the inspiration of the Spirit, is telling you, no, death is not the end. It's not over. You don't end your, your consciousness. You don't end your memories. You don't end your relationship. When you know the Lord, you're going to be with him. Oh, what glory there will be for us and in the Lord. And glory for him. We are his inheritance. Did you know that? We are his, his inheritance. Uh, he is ours. But we are his. What an exciting thing to think that he values us like that. He wants to be with us. Uh, it's his joy to, to have us for himself. And man, I want to be his. I want to be his every moment of my life. And, and with the message that we have, always abounding in the work of the Lord means so much. It's not just for us. Well, I'm saved. Praise the Lord. Let's go get some iced tea. Uh, you know what? I'm praised, or I'm, 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 uh, I'm saved, praise the Lord. Let's get some iced tea and let's go tell someone. Let's share with somebody. Let's serve our neighbor. Let's do something that's effective in ministering to other people. Well, you can turn on your radio all day long, listen to sermons all day long, some of which you shouldn't be listening to probably, uh, and some that are fantastic, and you should. Uh, and, and the feeding, the feeding, the feeding, the feeding. But why are we fed? So that we can say, I was fed? No, so that we get, are given the nutrients, so that we can go and abound in the work of the Lord. Serving, whether it's ministering to little kids at VBS or at a public school lunchroom, or however it is that God has wired us and gifted us to serve, to minister, to care about the lost. And you know what? I want to ask God to give us a harvest of souls. I've been praying about it lately. And I realized, man, if we had a bunch of people get saved around here, I don't know if we'd know what to do with them, you know? Uh, and yet, of all the churches in, that I know about, we, of all people, should know exactly what to do with them because we're a very well-fed church. We know the Word of God. And so take the Word of God and multiply, multiply, and, and abound in the work of the Lord. Don't say this is the end of the day because we had our Bible study, and now it's over. But how about... You, you run into somebody here or there. Just just to give you a quick example. Uh, well, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Okay, that's the end of the... <laughs> knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So, I teach at Longmont. The, the service started at 9 in the morning. Got over at 11 o'clock. By 11.10, I was out of the building and in the car, driving to the airport... Our flight left the airport at 2 o'clock. takes an hour to drive from the church to the airport. So from 11.15 to 12.15, and we timed it. It was beautiful. Gassed up the rental car, immediately go to the rental place, drop off the car, get in the bus, shuttle us over, go through the longest security line in the history of the earth. And finally we get in there, and we have about 15 minutes till our flight's going to board at 1.30 for a departure at 2 o'clock. So it's about 1.15. There's a little, like a walk-up bar where you can go and you can get a drink or you can get something to eat at this Mexican place. And it's, we're in a hurry. It's an airport. I'm going to sit down and get a table. So we belly up to the bar. And this girl comes rolling up right next to us. And she's uh, sitting next to Brenda. And the waitress comes up and says, what can I get for you? And she says, I'll have a double shot uh, gin and, and tonic. And so I said, oh. Okay, now keep in mind, what time is it? What, about 1.15. We have to board at 1.30. So I, I think, oh, wow. And so anyway, thinking to myself, it's kind of early for a double shot gin and tonic, you know? At least wait till 3, you know? I, I don't know, yeah. And so, so 
um, she, the, the server comes and says, would you like something to eat? And she says, no, I don't think I'll eat anything, but I'll have another one of these. Now, this is four shots of gin, right? And, and I, by, I can't help it. I'm a jerk. And so I look over at her and I said to her, because she's, I mean, she's that far away. And I said to her, how do you do that? How, how can you drink four shots? You know, I would be drunk if I drank four shots. I know that would happen to me. Uh, maybe my level of toleration for alcohol is lower than other people, but to me, four shots, is that's a, that's a lot for me. And I would be drunk. And I said, how do you do that? How, you, how are you going to do that? I said, where are you going anyway? And she says, well, I know this is weird, but I'm arriving. Now, I'm asking myself, why would a person that just landed home stop at a bar and get four shots of gin before leaving the airport? And now, by now, I mean, this it's moving fast. I mean, I'm eating my little burrito, and Brenda's eating her thing, and I'm trying to talk to Brenda, and there's crowds of people, and it's chaotic. And I finally looked over at her, and uh, Brenda's talking to her a bit, and, and, and I look at her, and I, I told her, I says, we got to go board, and I'm sorry to do this, but... I put my hand out and I said, whatever it is you're going to go home to, I know it's uncomfortable. And whatever it is that is bothering me, I just want you to know I'm going to pray for you. We're going to pray for you. She sobbed immediately. I never got a chance to ask her what's going on. What are you going home to? And I, I have to tell you, I, the, of all the days that you want to just miss your flight, you know? But guys, there's people like that everywhere. They're everywhere if we just will tune in and, and take the opportunities. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labors are not in vain in the Lord. And you know what? Brynn and I, I, I'm probably a weird Pentecostal, but I literally, as we walked away, prayed for her out loud with Brenda. I had Brenda by the hand, and I'm walking. I says, oh, God, touch that woman. I, I knew her name at the moment. It was she, I, I asked her her name, and I used her name. I can't remember right away now. And I prayed out loud, just touch her, reveal yourself to her. You know, God doesn't need our help. He likes it. He uses us, but he wants to use us and doesn't need us to, for him to make himself known to her. But look for opportunities. How can we serve? How can we love? Wouldn't you guys love it if every Wednesday night we had to baptize people? I would love it. God give us soul. I, I was thinking the other day, sorry, I'm going to wrap this up in one minute. William Booth, General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said, give me souls and give me the worst. That's what he said. Give me souls and give me the worst. Lord, thank you for your, for your grace. Thank you for the wisdom that you would put in our hearts and let it be only you that lead us and guide us into the things that you would have us to do. We trust you. We want to listen to you. We want to take risks. We want to step out in faith. We don't want to just be content to sit down and be fed. We want to be active in service. Let us abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labors are not in vain in the Lord. I thank you, Lord, for these things. In Jesus' name, bless your people tonight. Amen. God bless you guys.